Thanks. It's my pleasure to introduce Zach. Uh, he's a PhD candidate at Georgia Tech, uh, getting close to the end of his PhD, actually, uh, working with Professor Charlie Kemp. He received his master's from Georgia Tech and bachelor's at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Uh, his work is in a really interesting place where he's uh, bridging technically impressive machine learning simulation and interactions with robots helping people in their daily lives. Uh, this work has won him the best student paper award at i 2019 and was a finalist for the best paper in service robotics at ICRA 2019. Uh, I'm really excited to hear what Zach has to talk about. So Zach, go ahead and take it away. Oh, well, thank you, Michael. That's usually better than I do for myself. So that was a really great introduction. <laughs> so hello, everyone. I'm Zachary Erickson. Uh, and uh, today, I'd, I'm going to share some, of, share with you some of my research, past and ongoing research, on developing robotic caregivers and techniques for intelligent physical human-robot interaction. Uh, but before I begin, I should probably just briefly talk about and explain where I'm coming from. So I'm a fifth-year PhD candidate in the healthcare robotics lab at Georgia Tech, where I'm advised by Charlie Kemp, and I'm currently finishing my PhD. And as I finish up, my goal is to continue in academia and establish a lab of my own. So my research focuses on intelligent physical assistance, where robots are in close physical contact with people. These robots aren't just standing next to a person, they're touching the person, applying force, sensing and manipulating the human body. An example from my research on what this close physical interaction can look like is bathing assistance, where a robot is using a wet washcloth in order to clean off a person's body. Or dressing assistance, where a robot is helping someone with disabilities put on a fresh set of clothes for the day. Robots present an opportunity to have a profound impact and improve the quality of life for millions of older adults and people with disabilities. I really envision a world where robots are able to safely and intelligently interact with people on a physical level. And the motivation for this is, well, populations around the world are getting older. And that often leads to a greater number of people with disabilities that require daily physical care. So here's a world map in 2015 showing the population of a country's, the percentage of a country's population aged 65 and older, where yellow indicates less than 7% of the population and dark blue is over 28% of the population is over 65. And by the year 2050, the world is projected to look quite a bit different. Most countries are gonna be experiencing drastic shifts in their age demographics. And if we take this to the extreme, we can look at nations such as Japan that are actively looking for alternatives to human caregivers even today. So this is a population pyramid showing the population of people in each age range. And across the world, advanced countries are increasingly inverting their population pyramids as life expectancies are increasing and birth rates are decreasing. So robots present an opportunity to overcome shortages in human caregivers and ideally one day allow older adults to age in place, to remain independent in their homes. But because these robots are making close physical interaction and contact with people, robotic caregiving does present some crucial challenges. Now, one of the first challenges we face is common sense. How do we give robotic caregivers the ability to recognize how their actions physically affect people? Another challenge in robotic caregiving is the complex mechanics involved and a lot of visual occlusions, which means that we need sensing techniques that extend beyond vision. And additionally, safety is a significant concern since robots are in close physical contact with people and that has implications on how we can conduct research. For example, it's very difficult and costly to collect real world data because of safety concerns. So today I'd like to share with you a number of techniques that I've been developing towards overcoming these challenges and enabling intelligent physical interactions. We'll look at how robots can take on a person's perspective from a physical point of view to to estimate the forces that are being applied onto a person's body. By the way, you can all see the slides, is that correct? Perfect, okay, I'll continue. In order for robots to interact with people, they have to be able to sense the human body. So I'll introduce capacitive servoing, a new sensing technique for robots to sense and navigate along the human body. And at the end, we'll dive into a new topic that I think is really exciting which is how we can use physics simulation to safely train assistive robots and benchmark physical human robot interaction. So let's start by looking at the technical details behind how robots can take on a person's perspective and predict how their actions will apply force onto a person's body. 
So my research has applications in robotic caregiving, and most research in this domain has taken on a robot-centric perspective, focusing on how robots should move or take actions to perform various assistive tasks around the human body. This is especially true within the context of robot-assisted dressing, where robots are helping someone get dressed. And it feels natural for us as roboticists to think about problems from a robot-centric perspective. However, today I'd like to challenge you to think about robotics instead from a human-centric perspective. Now, since safety and comfort are important, one natural question that comes up is, well, can a robot estimate the forces it applies onto a person's body? Yet for the task of robot-assisted dressing, this question can be a little bit difficult to answer. First, deformable cloth is making contact with a person, which results in these complex force distributions. Visually estimating the coupled cloth and human body state remains exceptionally hard to do still, and it's difficult for robots to take on a, the perspective of a person. Right? Our summator sensory system, our skin, is, is wonderful for us, but not particularly useful in terms of providing data to robots. So to overcome this challenge, we've designed a physics-based simulation environment, like the one shown above here, which allows us to simulate how fabric interacts with and applies force onto the human body. And this environment consists of a few different elements. First, a robotic end effector pulling on the sleeve of a hospital gown onto a simulated arm. And the different colors that we see on this arm are what we call a force map, where each color indicates a magnitude of force applied at specific regions along the arm. Blue is low force, red is high force. And what I'd like to show you is how robots can use low dimensional haptic measurements at their end effector in order to estimate a high dimensional force map across a person's body in real time during assistance. So this is going to allow a robot to take on a person's perspective and view this task from a person's point of view in terms of how the person is having forces applied onto their body. So again, I'd like to share with you a novel technique in which robots can use low dimensional local measurements from their end effector, think sense of touch, combined with learning using temporal features in order to estimate high dimensional forces applied onto a person's body by deformable fabric. Now these force maps may look continuous and smooth along the arm, but they have a discrete representation underneath. So let's briefly look at that because it's gonna impact how we learn these force maps. So the human arm is discretized into 300 force sensing points. You can think of these as little force sensors all over the arm. Now our vertex on the deformable cloth mesh is gonna make contact with the simulated body at some arbitrary position X. It's gonna apply some force F. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna dis distribute the magnitude of that force to the nearby force sensing point on the, on the limb. And if we were just to color each of these force sensing points according to how much force is being applied to them, we'd end up getting a figure that looks kind of like this above. And then what we do is we perform an interpolation over all these points in order to generate a nice smooth force map along the arm. So now we want robots to be able to estimate these force maps. And the way we do this is by building an estimator, a function f that takes as input now prior end effector measurements from a robot, as well as current measurements from the robot, and use this information in order to estimate a force map across a person's body. Now, it's important to note here that this estimator does not have an explicit model or observation of the fabric. It's estimating force maps just from end effector measurements alone. So we're gonna be getting these end effector measurements in simulation from the end effector. This includes haptic and kinematic measurements, force, torque, and velocity. And in terms of the real world, these measurements are also gonna be quite easy for us to collect. We're gonna do so using a force torque sensor. And the sensor is connected to the fabric garment, which a robot is also holding. Now, in terms of implementing this estimator, we do so using a recurrent neural network. And at every time step, this network takes as input a window of or not a window, but a, a nine dimensional end effector measurement from the robot. And then outputs for us an estimated 300 dimensional force map across a person's arm. And here we're using an LSTM network or a long short term memory network for this estimator, but there are certainly other types of architectures or temporal models that would work here. What is important is to have some form of model that leverages temporal features in order to make this mapping tractable from a nine dimensional input to a 300 dimensional output. And so we can train this recurrent neural network using simulation. We perform 5,000 randomized dressing sequences in simulation with a goal where the robot is just trying to move around randomly in a self-supervised fashion, trying to observe lots of data of how fabric interacts with and applies force onto a person's body in different contexts. 
And so we can collect all this data in simulation and use it to train our estimator. But what happens is that if we try to just naively use this estimator, we end up getting some really weird scenarios like this, where the trained model is estimating these tiny forces all over a person's body, even though the cloth isn't in contact here. And this is, these are just regression errors. This is error in our recurrent neural network where the model is constantly estimating these small forces all the time. So to overcome this, we build a contact map, which robots are also going to be estimating. And just like the force map, this contact map is gonna have 300 points, one for each corresponding force sensing point along the limb. And this contact map is set up like a binary classification problem where for each point along the arm, it's gonna be assigned a value of one if the fabric is applying some non-zero force at that point, otherwise the contact map will receive a value of negative one. And if we bring this back into our recurrent neural network here, we're now gonna be estimating both a force map and a contact map across the person's limb. So we're gonna be estimating a 600 dimensional vector in total. And what we can do after performing an estimate is we can loop through all of the forces in the force map and zero out any of them in which the contact map indicates that there's no force being applied at that point. And so this is gonna allow a robot to estimate both how much force is being applied, but also if force is being applied to a specific region on a person's limb. And again, this is just to overcome these small errors in our regression model. And in practice, we find that it works, it works quite well. So let's look at that. How well are we able to estimate force maps in simulation? On the right is the ground truth force map. This is the forces the cloth is actually applying to the simulated body. And on the left, we're going to be visualizing the estimated forces. This is the output of our recurrent model. And so here we're looking at two different scenarios. The first one, we have a hospital gown. The sleeve of the hospital gown is going to be pulled onto the forearm. It's going to kind of tug and pull at the elbow here and apply force at the elbow. And in the second case, the sleeve is going to miss the forearm entirely and just get dragged over the upper arm. But what we're seeing is that in both cases, the estimated forces, the estimated force maps are closely aligning with what we would expect to observe from simulation. And this learning-based technique can also generalize to other tasks with deformable fabric, such as pulling on a pair of shorts onto a leg, where here the shorts get caught on the heel of a foot and start to tug and apply force there. But the big question is, can this generalize to real robots interacting with real people? It seems possible, since our recurrent network here only needs measurements from a robot's end effector. It, in fact, doesn't need to know anything about the state of this high dimensional a deformable cloth fabric. But instead of just estimating force maps, let's take it one step further and look at how real robots can predict these force maps into the future. Doing so will allow us to explore the question of how will a robot's future actions apply force onto a person? Can we select actions that minimize future forces? So in order to predict force maps into the future, we're now gonna set up two different models, both a predictor and an estimator. And this, this first model, the predictor, is again going to take as input prior measurements from a robot's end effector, but now also the set of proposed future actions that a robot could execute. And then given this information, we want our predictor to output for us a set of predicted future measurements that a robot could expect to observe if it were to execute those future actions. And here H sub P is the prediction horizon. That's how far into the future the robot is looking. And if you're familiar with what a dynamics model is, this predictor is essentially a dynamics model. And in terms of the estimator, well, we're gonna use this same estimator that we've already trained, but I wanna change the notation of it slightly here. So the estimator is gonna take as input prior measurements from a robot again, but now also these predicted future measurements. So we're gonna output, we're gonna pass the output of our predictor into our estimator now. And then given this information, we want our estimator to now output for us a predicted future force and contact map across the person's limb. And again, we're using the same estimator that we've already trained that we saw just a few slides ago. But now what's really cool about this approach is we can start to do function composition where we have f of g. And this is gonna allow us to go directly from robot measurements and future actions straight to a predicted force map across a person's body. And so now we can piece together our predictive model. We'll, we'll connect the predictor with the estimator. And this will allow us to predict force maps across a person's body that a robot could expect to observe if it were to execute those actions those proposed candidate actions from the left-hand side. In terms of implementing this predictor and estimator, well, the estimator is really simple. We've already implemented and trained it, so we're just gonna use it here. But now in terms of the predictor, well, we're gonna use the same recurrent neural network arch architecture that we used for the estimator. 
but we're going to train a separate model. This model will have different inputs and outputs. But a nice aspect of this approach is that we can use the same self-supervised self data collection technique that we use to train the estimator to also train the predictor. So we'll collect thousands of randomized stressing sequences in simulation, observe all that data and use it to train the predictor. And so at this point, we now have a full predictive model for predicting these future force maps across applied onto a person's body. So how do we use these force maps to control a robot then? Well, we're gonna do so using a technique called model predictive control or MPC, in which we're gonna select actions that minimize the cost function, specifically the function shown above here. Now I apologize for throwing just a bunch of arbitrary variables in the slides. So let's walk through what each of these terms are gonna be doing one by one. This first term is gonna be encouraging the robot to select actions that minimize predicted forces applied onto the human. This is that term that's gonna be minimizing these predicted force maps that we've been looking at so far. The second term is gonna be encouraging the robot to be making task progress, essentially moving forward along a, part a participant's or person's arm. And this last term is gonna be discouraging the robot from rotating its end effector whenever possible. And so that's it to this controller. We then set up a human robot study wherein a peer to robot assist 10 able-bodied participants with the task of dressing on the sleeve of a hospital gown. And specifically here, we're looking at two different scenarios. First, can the robot use this approach to fully pull on the sleeve of a hospital gown? But in the second case, can the robot use this to mitigate the cloth from getting caught on a person's body? And here, what we're going to do is we're gonna vary the prediction horizon anywhere from 0.01 seconds all the way up to 0.2 seconds. And this is that H sub P, the prediction horizon that we're gonna be changing. And so if we prevent the robot from looking very far into the future, what we observe is that the robot doesn't recognize that it's about to apply large force onto a person's body until, well, it's already too late and it's now starting to tug and pull at a person's elbow. Yet by allowing the robot to predict further into the future, the robot is able to recognize that a garment would soon get caught on a, or, or soon apply large forces onto a person's elbow. And it then rotates around the person's elbow in order to fully pull the garment up to a person's shoulder and the robot successfully pulled a garment up to a participant's shoulder in almost all the trials that we had tested with the participants. And similarly, by preventing the robot from looking very far into the future, the robot doesn't recognize that a garment is about to get caught on a person's hand and apply large forces until, well, it's already too late. The garment has gotten caught and it's starting to tug and pull on a participant's hand here. Yet again, by allowing the robot to predict further into the future, the robot is able to recognize that a garment would soon get caught on a person's hand. It then lowers its end effector downwards closer to a person's arm, shown here by this red line. And this allows the robot to mitigate the garment from entirely getting caught on a person's body. So overall, we've seen a novel human perspective taking technique that combines low dimensional end effector measurements with model-based learning for predicting these high dimensional force maps across a person's limb. And when we combine these predictions with model predictive control, a robot was able to provide physical dressing assistance from a human-centric perspective based on how their actions would apply force onto a person's body. But one limitation of this approach is that we did not model human motion. Now, there are ways of simulating human motion, uh, and we'll see a way of doing that later on in this talk, but we instead started investigating a more direct way of adapting to human motion. So what I'd like to talk about next is how robots can directly sense human motion. And specifically, I'll introduce a new sensing technique called capacitive servoing to track human motion in real time and navigate a robot's end effector around the human body. So when physically interacting with people, it can be helpful for robots to be able to sense where a person's body is. And there's been a couple of different approaches proposed for doing this in the past. One of the most common approaches is using visual-based perception, such as uh, with a camera. For example, you might be familiar with different tools or libraries such as open pose. However, things like the robot's body or different objects like fabric garments can all visually occlude sight of a person. Now, another approach that's been used in the past is using force-based perception where a robot uses its sense of touch or a force torque sensor in order to estimate where a person's pose is. Yet this requires robots to be continuously making contact with a person in order to sense their body. And more recently, my colleagues and other research groups have demonstrated how robots can use a pressure mat on a bed in order to estimate a human pose and full 3D human mesh model. Yet such approaches struggle with estimating local pose details or tracking human motion in real time. 
But I really want to emphasize, why can't we just use a camera on a robot? It seems like the most intuitive thing to try first. And it turns out that there's a lot of scenarios in physical interaction where substantial parts of the human body become visually occluded. In this case right here, about halfway through the stressing scenario, the robot can no longer see a person's body. Not only is the robot's own arm getting in the way of its cameras, but this fabric garment is also visually occluding sight of a person. And this lack of vision is one of the major challenges that capacitive sensing aims to address. And in fact, in this video here, the robot is using capacitive servoing to adapt to any arm movements made by this participant. So in comparison to other pose estimation approaches, capacitive sensing offers robots a number of benefits. It allows robots to sense through visually opaque materials such as clothing, wet cloth. It doesn't require robots to make physical contact with a person in order to sense them and it allows robots to track human motion in real time. And so what I'd like to share with you is how we have developed new capacitive sensors that can be used to accurately sense local human motion and human pose near a robot's end effector. We use learning to build pose estimation models from capacitance data. And then we evaluate through human studies how robots can use this sensor to perform servoing around the human body and adapt to human motion during physical assistance. But first, what is a capacitive sensor and well, how does it work? Well, you might be familiar with the classic physics defi definition of a parallel plate capacitor, where we have two parallel conductive plates. One is a sensor, the other one is a ground plate. And given the setup, we can use a common capacitance equation in order to determine the distance between these two plates where we have some constants K, which is a dielectric constant, epsilon naught, which is the permittivity of space, as well as a surface area and a capacitance measurement from the sensor. And it turns out we can use this exact same approach to sense the human body. We again have a conductive sensing plate, but now the human body becomes the ground and we can use similar techniques and equations in order to determine the distance to a person's body. And you're actually probably very familiar with capacitive sensing. You might even use it every single day. Touchscreens on consumer devices use capacitive sensing to detect when we make contact with the screen. And so we've built off of this concept of capacitive sensing. We've developed a single axis capacitive sensor, which could be either held or mounted to a robot's end effector. And then we explored how a robot can use this sensor to estimate the vertical distance to a person's body in real time while providing assistance. So with this sensor, we collected data from a single human participant as a peer to robot move this capacitive sensor downwards towards a person's hand. And we can plot this data as shown here, kind of distance versus capacitance. And in order to estimate distance from a capacitance measurement, we use a nonlinear least squares optimization technique to fit a function to this data, a function inspired by the capacitance equation for a parallel plate capacitor. And so that gives us a very simple and fast function for estimating the vertical distance from a robot's end factor to a person's limb. We then conducted a study with 10 able-bodied participants in which the robot used this capacitive sensing technique to sense and adapt to the vertical arm motions made by participants while dressing on two different garments, both a hospital gown, which isn't shown in this case, but what's shown here is a long sleeve sweater. And when participants were to hold their arms steady, what we observed is that capacitive sensing allowed the robot to follow end effector trajectories along the contours of the human body. And here the blue line and shading represents the mean and standard deviation of the robot's movement from our trials as the robot adapted and, and, and attempted to keep its end effector five centimeters above a participant's arm throughout the trial. And in more recent work, we have used capacitive sensing uh, and, and, and demonstrated that capacitive sensing can generalize to providing dressing assistance to individuals with physical disabilities. This same model optimized on a single able by participant generalized to people with disabilities. And in this case here, the robot is using capacitive sensing to adapt dressing trajectories that it has learned in simulation. And capacitive sensing is allowing the robot to adapt to the involuntary vertical motions made by this participant with cerebral palsy while dressing both sleeves of a hospital gown. But there is a limitation with this sensor. This single axis sensor is only able to sense the vertical distance away from a person's limb. It's not able to sense other types of motions or distances such as this lateral distance where the arm is no longer directly underneath the sensor. 
nor is it able to estimate or sense the orientation of a person's limb in space. So how can we estimate this kind of human motion during physical human robot interaction? Well, we do so by developing a multi-dimensional capacitive sensor. And this sensor consists of a three by two grid of copper capacitive electrodes connected to an Arduino microcontroller board. And now with this new multi-electrode capacitive sensor, the robot can again sense the human body from about 10 to 15 centimeters away. We can sample capacitance measurements at frequencies over 100 Hertz. And most importantly, we're able to sense the four dimensional relative position and orientation of a nearby human limb. But what do I mean by sensing four dimensional pose? Well, here's a PR2 robot again, and in the center is the capacitive sensor. And if we zoom in, what we're gonna be looking at is a point on the person's limb that's closest to the center of the capacitive sensor. And so given this point, let's look at what is this relative pose that a robot is sensing? What are these four dimensions? Well, the first two dimensions are gonna be this lateral and vertical distance between the capacitive sensor and the closest point on the person's limb. The third dimension is this pitch orientation now between the sensor and the central axis of a person's limb. And then finally, the yaw orientation, again, between the sensor and the central axis of a limb. Together, this represents the four-dimensional pose of a person's limb that the robot is sensing. And if you're wondering why this isn't six dimensions, it's because of the ambiguity along the central axis of a cylindrically shaped limb. So in order for a robot to perform capacitive circling, we start by collecting time-varying capacitance measurements from a single human participant as the PR2 moves the capacitive sensor around both a person's arm and leg. We then feed all this data in and train a fully connected feed forward neural network, which takes as input a window of prior capacitance measurements and then outputs an estimated pose of a person's limb at a given time step. And now in order to control a robot to perform servoing around the human body, we use a PD controller to update the robot's target end effector pose. And this is a fairly straightforward controller, so I'm not gonna dive into the details of how it works, but I will note that one of the benefits of using capacitive sensing is that it enables robots to perform complex assistive tasks, like helping someone get dressed or cleaning off their body with very simple control algorithms. So now that we have a controller and a way of estimating the human pose, we conducted a study in which a PR2 robot assisted four able-bodied participants with two different tasks. The first one we've already seen before, dressing, pulling on the sleeve of a hospital gown onto a person's arm. But the second task is now bathing in which the robot is using a wet washcloth in order to clean off a person's arm or leg. And when providing dressing assistance, we observed that the robot was able to use capacitive servoing to sense and adapt to human motion, such as these lateral arm movements and rotations that we see here. And in the next part of our experiments, we assessed how the robot can use this same approach to assist with another task, bathing. We hear the robot is using capacitive servoing along with a wet washcloth in order to navigate and clean off the surface of a person's leg. And overall, we find that this approach, it works well, but it isn't perfect. Sensing the human limb through wet cloth is more challenging with a capacitive sensor. And here's an example in which the robot failed to fully clean off the leg where it briefly lost track of the leg near the knee. This resulted in it missing some of the, the blue powder near the knee and uh, resulting into a, a failure case. However, similarly, bathing assistance along the human arm, despite only being trained on a single human participant and with limited training data, capacitive servoing was still able to generalize across multiple people with varying sized limbs and generalize across both arms and legs. And in ongoing work, we're also characterizing this capacitive servoing technique around the human body. So here's a quick plot showing the distance estimation error as a capacitive sensor gets progressively further away from a human arm as depicted in that semicircular planar region on the left hand figure there. And so here dark blue uh, represents low estimation error whereas green is high error. And the capacitive sensor is working best when at most 15 centimeters from the arm where the mean pose estimation error within this region is about 1.5 centimeters. And in a human study with 12 participants, Capacitive servoing was able to keep a robot's end effector on average within one centimeter from a target distance away from a human arm while simultaneously navigating a trajectory along the arm. And the servoing technique also has broader implications as there are many contexts in healthcare where we want to move various sensors or devices around a person's body. 
So overall, capacitive servoing is a new technique that enables robots to both follow trajectories along the body and track human motion in real time. We've developed new capacitive sensors for robots to accurately sense the human body. We've trained pose estimation models based on capacitance data. And then we've performed servoing and evaluations through human studies in which we found that the servoing approach generalizes well across people from multiple physical assistance tasks. But there still remains a question. How can we train robots to be versatile caregivers? How do we give robots common sense around people? What we'd like is for, have, for robots to have common sense that's applicable across many different people and many different tasks. And historically, there's been well over a decade of active work on designing robotic systems to physically assist people with tasks ranging from feeding and drinking to dressing to hygiene assistance. Yet in almost every case, it's a single robot helping a small group of people with only a single task. Robots aren't able to learn common sense about the human body that transcends multiple tasks or scenarios. And this is because there are some huge hurdles in the field of physical human robot interaction. First, capable real world robots are not cheap. Conducting human studies is also arguably, arguably not that cheap. And this has probably been one of the largest barriers of entry for researchers into this field. There are also risks associated with robots coming in close physical contact with people. And we would never want robots to accidentally hurt someone or put someone at risk. And lastly, collecting data and performing evaluations on a real robot interacting with real people is really slow. And this is especially true when performing evaluations or conducting studies with people with disabilities. These challenges limit not only the kinds of research that we can do, but also who can do this kind of research. But what if we can use physics simulation to overcome these challenges? At the beginning of this talk, we had seen how a real robot was able to leverage simulation in order to predict the forces applied onto a person's body and dress these deformable garments. And physics simulation could be generalized towards training versatile assistive robots and learning common sense, simulating many different robots helping many people with a variety of tasks. And recently there's been a growing push for these multitask simulation environments where we can train or evaluate robots across a large number of diverse tasks. Yet most of these are within a robot manipulation or navigation context. In fact, there's a complete lack of simulating robots physically interacting with people in any framework. So this brings us to the final chapter of our story here, which is how physics simulation can open up entirely new research directions and opportunities within physical human-robot interaction. Towards versatile and intelligent robotic caregivers, my research has recently introduced Assistive Gym, the first open source physics-based simulation framework for modeling physical human-robot interaction and robotic assistance. Now with simulation, my research has been investigating how we can use this tool to develop versatile, intelligent robotic caregivers. We've introduced several physics-based environments for physical assistance. We've developed baselines and benchmarks for robotic caregiving, and we've investigated generalization of physical human robot interaction from a number of angles, including human motion, preferences, and variation in human body shape and impairments. Now, one of the first research opportunities that we gain with simulation is the ability to train versatile assistive robots and develop control algorithms towards common sense reasoning. For example, we've developed physics-based environments where robots have learned to assist people with different tasks associated with activities of daily living, such as bathing, feeding, or dressing assistance. And these tasks are selected from literature such that if we were to have versatile robots that could help with them, it would have real world impact and be meaningful to many people with disabilities. Now physics simulation has also enabled us to establish benchmarks and baselines for physical human robot interaction. And this is something that the field of computer vision has done remarkably well at. And I believe physical HRI can benefit from that same mindset. So towards this goal, we've introduced a set of baseline control policies with assistive gym, each trained with proximal policy optimiza optimization and actor critic deep reinforcement learning technique. We trained 24 policies, one for each task and robot combination in assistive gym. 
where each policy is trained for 50,000 simulation rollouts. And we select the best policy out of three random seeds. And the first question we should be thinking about is, well, how well do these baseline policies perform in simulation? So when assisting a person who holds a static body pose, these baseline controllers were able to achieve reasonable performance for several of the assistive tasks, including itch scratching, bed bathing, feeding, and drinking assistance. But it's also worth noting here that there's still significant room for improvement in future research, right? These are, these are just baseline controllers. They're not solving the field of robotic care for us. And a very clear example of this is that all robots struggled to provide dressing and arm manipulation assistance to an inactive human. Yet by simulating physical interaction, we can now create reproducible benchmarks for assistive robotics. We can now quantify how various robots and controllers are performing when interacting with people across different tasks. And this table here shows the average reward the baseline controllers achieved for each task and robot combination, where, bo where the bolding represents the best robot for a given task. And creating physical interaction benchmarks like this is something that's exceptionally difficult and costly to do in the real world. And we've also investigated modeling and benchmarking human motion, where we used a co-optimization technique to simultaneously learn collaborative human assistance for both a robot and a human. So we simultaneously trained control policies, both for a robot and a human, where both uh, robot and human are sharing the same state and rewards, but they receive different observations. So we observed that pretty much across the board, robots were able to provide better assistance and achieve higher rewards when assisting an active human who performs collaborative motions. And this improved assistance also showed up in quantitative task success metrics, where again, robots are able to provide more successful assistance when interacting with a collaborative human who's performing collaborative motions with the robot. And if we look at task success rates from the best performing robots for each task, there were some tasks like bathing and dressing assistance that significantly benefited from human motion. With physics simulation, we're able to evaluate how assistive robot controllers are performing when interacting with people that exhibit varying levels of human motion. Another research direction that we gain with physics simulation is the ability to design techniques for generalizing assistive robots across varying human body shapes, weights, and impairments. For example, if we were to want to say train or evaluate an assistive robotic system on 50,000 people with different body sizes and disabilities, in simulation, this would take maybe six to 12 hours, fully automated. And on the left is a visualization from ongoing research where we're investigating assistive robots that can generalize across a large distribution of human body proportions, weights, and sizes. Yet in the real world, 50,000 participants is immediately disqualified. That's far too large of a number. And we instead think, let's just test on 10 able-bodied college students instead. And that'll still take a week to do that kind of study. If we want 10 real participants with disabilities, it's a much slower process. It could easily take over a month to conduct a study like that. Another really interesting research topic that becomes available is modeling human preferences and developing control algorithms that learn and adapt to a person's preferences. So Assistive Gym provides a reward-based structure for modeling human preferences. And what that allows us to do is train robots that adapt their assistance to different preferences. For example, robots are penalized more for spilling water on a person rather than spilling water on the floor. And robots learn to not apply large forces onto a person's body. But you also might be wondering if modeling human preferences actually matters. So what I'd like to introduce you to is one of the very early development versions of assistive gym where we were not modeling human preferences. And here the robot has learned to help someone drink water using reinforcement learning. And as it turns out, the fastest way to get water into someone's mouth is to literally just to catapult water at their face. So essentially just precision water throwing here. And this is one of the reasons why I believe it's important to give robots common sense around people. Throwing water does solve the task at hand, but it's clearly not the right way to interact with people. So again, physics simulation opens up a number of exciting and new research directions for physical HRI and robotic caregiving which my research has begun to investigate. Now, there are a number of other extensions or 
other research directions that Seb, I don't have the time to talk about in this talk here, but I would like to just mention them briefly. So Assistive Gym is an evolving framework that's been adopted at other, at other universities and as a part of a collaboration with researchers at Stanford, Assistive Gym has been integrated with iGibson, which now allows us to simulate robots physically interacting with people in these visually realistic and interactive home environments. Physics simulation has also enabled us to design a new course on robotic caregivers, which I have co-developed and co-instructed at Georgia Tech for two different semesters now. And Assistive Gym has enabled students to learn new concepts without risking expensive robot hardware and allow students to explore human robot studies without needing to deal with IRB approval. Yet if we take a step back again for a moment and look at what we've seen so far with Assistive Gym, everything exists solely in simulation. However, we're interested in robots one day providing assistance to real people. Yet within the context of assistive robotics, people are one of the greatest sources of variation between simulation and the real world. So can we evaluate these simulation trained robots with real people? And our approach to this was introducing assistive VR gym, a way of safely evaluating and improving simulation trained robots with real people. So assistive VR gym is a new approach that uses virtual reality to help bridge the gap between simulation and the real world by bringing real people into physics simulation to receive assistance from virtual robots. Now within robotics, virtual reality is often used as a method for teleoperation or providing demonstrations to a robot. And VR has also been used within rehabilitation robotics for training and assessing rehab metrics. But rather than having people take control of a robot, we're using virtual reality so that people can take control of a virtual human model to physically interact with these virtual assistive robots. And this may seem a little odd or unusual at first, but virtual reality is giving us a number of benefits. It allows us to collect real human motion trajectories and evaluate simulation trained assistive robots with real people. And we're able to do that while negating the risks associated with physical interaction. So assistive VR gym couples virtual reality with the assistive gym environments. And here are three different perspectives of what that VR setup looks like, both in the real world and in simulation. For virtual reality, we use the Oculus Rift S headset for tracking and aligning both the head and waist orientations of a human model. That, that kind of motion is shown just briefly in this clip. And then we use these two handheld touch controllers in order to map a participant's arm movements to the virtual human model, again, shown in this short clip here. And if you can recall, we had seen the slide just a little while ago where we had trained these baseline controllers for each task in assistive gym. But what happened is when we tested these uh, baseline policies in early pilot studies, we observed that these policies didn't work at all, at all with real people. And this was, this was a bit surprising to us since everything was working fairly well in simulation, but now these policies aren't able to provide assistance to simulated, uh, to real people, even though they're working with simulated people. And this is where, really where virtual reality came into play. What VR exposed is the distribution of human biomechanics in simulation did not match the distribution of real human biomechanics. Namely, this was a variation in human body shape and waist bending orientations. And so by using virtual reality, we were able to improve the biomechanics of simulated people and then train improved robot policies based on these new biomechanics. And so now we had to have a set of original baseline policies and this set of newly trained improved policies based on improved biomechanics. And what that allowed us to do is set up a formal study with eight able-bodied participants in which participants received assistance from virtual robotic caregivers. And so in comparison to the original baseline policies, these new improved policies were able to better generalize to assisting real people in VR. Participants also noted that virtual reality gave them a sense of presence where they felt like they were actually there interacting with a robot. For itch scratching assistance, the original baseline policies didn't work a single time in virtual reality, but the improved policies are now able to provide itch scratching assistance in 62% of the trials that we had tested with participants. And similarly, for drinking assistance, the improved, the improved policies are now starting to succeed with real people. And sort of icing on the cake here is that we can use data from our virtual reality human study in order to statistically analyze if human biomechanics really did differ between simulation and, uh, and real people in VR. 
And so using a Wilcox and signed rank test, we observed a statistically significant difference in human body shape between the original assistive gym environments and real people in VR. But we did not find a statistically significant difference between the new improved human biomechanics and again, participants in VR. And we get similar results by applying the same statistical test to human waste movements, where again, the improved simulation biomechanics are better matching real human biomechanics. And so after all of this, we've now seen how physics simulation opens up exciting and new research directions for physical HRI and robotic caregiving, developing new assistive environments, benchmarking physical interaction, and designing techniques for generalization and adaptation. We've also seen a virtual reality technique for bridging the reality gap between assistive gym and simulation and the real world, allowing us to evaluate simulation trained robots with real people, improve these physically assistive robots, and then collect training data with real human motion. And we can do all of that without the risks associated with physical interaction. So in conclusion, we've discussed three different techniques now towards enabling robots to intelligently interact with and assist people on a physical level. And we introduced these to begin overcoming some of the core challenges in robotic caregiving that arise when performing close physical interactions between robots and people. But the main takeaway is that this has all been working towards the development of intelligent robotic caregivers that can one day assist people who require daily care and physical assistance with activities of daily living. So wrapping up, I'd like to thank and the amazing group of undergraduate and master's students whom I've had the honor of mentoring during my PhD. And a lot of the research that I presented today was made possible because of them and their contributions. And several of these students are now PhD students themselves or on their way to soon becoming so. And of course, a thank you to my outstanding collaborators that have helped make this research possible, especially with conducting human studies and developing research ideas. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending. It's been a joy sharing this research with you. And I'd be happy to take any questions now. Thank you, everyone. That was a super interesting talk. Thanks. I'll, uh, the only person I'm muted, I'll give you some applause over here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, let's start us off with some questions. So I'm curious, when these robots fail, are they yeah. failing in a way that you can control? Do they fail safely, or is it like catastrophic, you know, throwing someone off their chair? Yeah, so when they fail, are they failing catastrophically? I would oftentimes say that, well, at least, so with respect to the studies that we're conducting in our lab, failures are oftentimes not catastrophic in nature. Um, as designed by the study, there's a lot of safety mechanisms to make sure that there is no catastrophic failures. Um, that's how we maybe lose IRB approval. Um, so within, so like at least within a simulation environment, right? Where you don't have to have all that safety. And like you ask to scratch. I see, I see. So yeah, yeah, so within a simulation environment, then failures can definitely be a little bit more interesting. Uh, so I would actually say that it, it kind of, it, it oftentimes depends. Um, a, it depends on the, the task at hand, but it also kind of depends on what kind of controller you're using for robots um, and how well that controller, if it's learning based, how well is that controller trained? So oftentimes, especially when you're starting to train a policy, it's doing pretty wild and crazy things. And oftentimes you'll see things like spoons and forks going into eyes and all these kind of crazy things you would never ever want to see in the real world. And I guess one of the, that's probably one of the major ask benefits of simulation is that robots can, A, they can make these kind of mistakes and then they can learn from these mistakes to hopefully not do those, these kind of things in the real world. Especially if you have some sort of metric or a way of informing robots that they've made a mistake. Very good question. Maybe I can share my slides again so you can all kind of see what we're looking at here. Great question. Any other questions? Yeah, if, if nobody wants to go, I had a, okay, it, it's maybe, I don't, I don't really know much about the area, so maybe, so maybe it's an unhelpful technical question, but, um, I'm kind of wondering, um, did you see that it basically, is it a problem that you don't know how the human is gonna move in response to what your robot is doing, right? Like that seems like a major problem that you didn't talk about that much, except 
just briefly mentioning it. But, uh, and that's also the problem that would be the hardest to learn because you just, if you don't have the data for, you know, how the humans actually move, I, I don't know how you would learn that. So, uh, I, I mean, one very naive thought of how you, you, you could solve that is maybe you could just collect the data. So maybe you could just look at human caregivers and record how the, uh, how the person who you're uh, your assisting moves in response. Uh, there are a lot of ethical questions I imagine there, but if you could solve those, would that something be, would that be something that's useful? Yeah, no, this is this is a really nice question. There's, there's kind of a, you, you presented a lot of nice insight there. Um, yes, modeling human motion is definitely a challenge. It's a challenge in the real world being able to sense and adapt to that kind of motion, but also in simulation, how do you model that? Right? How do you model realistic human motion? It's by no means, I can not, definitely not claim that it's solved in simulation. It's still actually active research. I have a collaboration actually looking at that specific problem of how do you model in simulation more realistic human motion? What does realistic human motion even mean within an assistive context? Um, and so those sad, I think sadly, I don't have great answers to that because it's still a big open problem. Uh, it is definitely um, an, an issue. Um, there is, so we've, we've obviously, I, I presented a little bit about it. We've, we've had some ways of modeling human motion in, in, in simulation. It makes some assumptions, um, which is essentially that humans are collaborative. That's not always an assumption that's true. Um, and yeah, so, so we've, we've started to investigate it. I would say moving forward, it's actually one of the big questions. If we want to simulate people and we don't want them to just hold a static pose, what is reasonable motion that they could be doing in, in accordance to uh, in, in accordance to a robot, right? There's kind of like this coupled robot and human movement where if a robot moves a certain way, a human might move um, to adapt to that kind of motion, right, vice versa. So uh, there's even it's even like a bigger question of like the type of motion that a human exhibits might be, um, A, it might be specific to what the robot is doing. Um, so if you change the robot or change the robot motion, the human would also do something different. Um, but there's also like the internal implicit things like, what the person perceives they want to do, what are their internal goals, what is their preferences, these kind of things. So there's a lot of different factors that go into human motion. And we've we've just started investigating how can we start to pull those out and, and model human motion and simulation. Very good question. Hopefully that answered a little bit of it. Sorry, it's not a it's not a solution. Um, <laughs> more yeah, so but... as an acknowledgement that it is an open question. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you can walk away from the technical side a little bit and just talk about how do the, the different types of subjects react on a personal level to the assisting social systems, the able bodied people, the impaired people? What are they saying? Uh, could you repeat that? The... Yeah, so like, so you're I missed some of it. robots with. Um, with people who have CP or stroke and stuff like that. And so I'm curious, how are they actually responding on a personal level to seeing these sorts of systems? Okay, yeah. So this is, this is nice. So uh, it requires a little bit of context from my lab. So my research is obviously one approach is one lens. And I've done some work with um, people with physical disabilities. Um, but in general, my, my lab, the Healthcare Box Lab, has done a lot of work in the past. I'm looking at essentially what are people's preferences or uh, how do they perceive these kind of assisted robots? Uh, so it, within my own research, people are often very open to this kind of assistance. Um, many times they see this as a way of lessening the burden on their own caretakers. So oftentimes people that have physical disabilities, they don't have a 24 seven care, like professional caregiver. It's oftentimes family members that are helping with them. And so for people that need this kind of assistance, they oftentimes see these automated systems as a way of gaining some level of independence so that they're not, they don't feel like a burden on their caretakers. Whether they actually are a burden or not is, is a different question, right? But they don't, they have a perceived level of independence. And so within that regard, I've actually been quite, maybe not surprised, but I've been quite happy with how people, at least within my studies, have been perceiving these types of assistive robots. And this also is true for caregivers in the hospital environment. Um, uh, now, outside of my research, uh, the, essentially my entire lab has been doing a lot of studies in this over the past I don't know, probably decade or so. 
Um, and we see varying levels of kind of perceived usefulness of a robot. So it, it's almost task dependent. Depending on the task, older adults or people with physical disabilities either would like a human caregiver or a robot to do that task, right? Um, and so there's, there's different papers on that from our lab. Uh, one thing to note from that though, is that oftentimes these types of uh, participants, older adults or people with physical disabilities, they're oftentimes more receptive to robotic care once they've started to interact with robots and they can see what robots are able to do. Um, so that is one kind of nugget that I would, I would convey there is that oftentimes their perception does shift towards the uh, more assistance from robots. Um, at least before where it started. Very cool. Yeah, so that's just been some of my experience. Maybe you've also seen similar things in your research, Michael. Yeah, so I, I think for me, looking a lot more at the clinicians, there's such a bias with the people we bring in to already being open to robots. Right? They know they come into a robotics lab, but when we work with clinicians, a lot of times they're not open to robots. And it's like, no, no, try this thing out. And then after they've tried it out, they're like, oh, this is cool. Um, yeah. And so that's been, and that's well known in usability across everything, cell phones, computers, all of it. Yep. Yeah. So. We've noticed similar things in studies. Uh, I mean, actually just in general, just interactions with um, clinicians is that um, even here at, at the Emory um, Rehabilitation Hospital or, or different um, units within the Emory Hospital here in Atlanta, uh, there are many times where we've actually had clinicians tell us that there are inpatients, patients that are staying in the hospital, there are some times where they have to wait two to three hours in the morning before there's a caretaker that's available to help them get, get, just get dressed in the morning, right? Um, and so there's oftentimes a, a lack of availability for assistance just because of the amount of assistance that's needed and kind of the, the stress that's put on some of these caretakers to perform these kind of everyday tasks, they have to do it. Um, they, they don't get a lot of the social interactions that they enjoy with, um, with the patients. It's more focused on let's just get the task done. And so they've also been open to these types of systems when we've been interacting with them. Yeah, these are great questions. Anything else? Happy to talk more about this. This is, I love these kind of discussions. Um, so, I mean, I'm, you know, the natural question from this sort of thing is how does it generalize? You know, you've shown a couple of specific tasks, um, some that I think are pretty heavily engineered um, and some that are getting more general, you know, where is the trajectory? Yeah, so how does it generalize? Probably my, my short answer is that hopefully simulation will give us a window towards generalization. One of the challenges with doing real human studies is it's very difficult to get, at least in terms of evaluation, it's very difficult to get a large diverse population pool um, and getting a large diverse population pool takes a long time, um, even if, if, if it is even possible. Uh, so hopefully simulation does provide us a window to overcome some of these challenges. Um, obviously we've seen that through this talk where we're able to simulate lots of different people and ho hopefully if, if nothing else, at least be able to evaluate different controllers that we're designing on lots of different people and be able to make some statements about how well these robots are likely to generalize to different people of different disabilities or different body proportions, right? Without having to actually go and test it out with literally every single person within the population, right? Um, so I would say that's hopefully one goal towards generalization. It's a big question. It's not specific to just assisted robotics. I mean, generalization is probably the big question across robotics in general, is, is uh, how do you get it to this type of research, just in general robotics research, to get out of the lab and generalize to real world environments? And that's, it's definitely a big question. Um, of course, with this research, I would say the, a lot of what I've been looking at is just generalizing across people because there's so much variation across people. Yeah, that's a really good question as well. And it's very tricky. It's there. There is sadly we're we're making progress as a field towards like what are good standard methods for working towards generalization, um, especially within simulation. Right? Um, how can we look at generalization within a simulation context, and then does that can we map that progress to the real world? Um, but it's still, I would say, very much in its early stages, especially within physical HRI.
Well, and I just feel like specifically, let's say for your dressing example, how well does it work if you throw away the hospital gown and you give somebody like a dress shirt to get put on? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. So uh, maybe it works. <laughs> and it, one of the biggest challenges that if, if you're referring to like the, the first work on human perspective taking, we actually had to simulate the cloth. Um, the simulation is actually optimized according to that the parameters, essentially data collected about that real cloth interacting with different objects in the real world. We collect data of how the, the fabric applies force onto the robot and we use that data to optimize the simulator. So in a sense, the simulator is very much optimized to that specific garment, that specific cloth and, and the friction of that cloth and the deformations that cloth can take. Uh, so at least in that context, I would say it probably won't generalize unless you're using garments that are of similar shape and similar fabric properties. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the technique won't generalize. It just means that you need to be able to have a greater model of different types of garments and different types of fabric properties, right? And so if you can model a larger distribution of, of these kind of parameters, then you can start learning this kind of um, general, you can start modeling this kind of generalization to different garments, to um, to essentially taking this kind of notion and bringing it to more general environments, general tasks, scenarios. So yes, this, this specific work though is very specific. I would not expect it to generalize to other garments, um, but it doesn't mean it can't. It just requires a little bit of extra work, I think. Yeah, well, thank you. I know we're technically over the four o'clock time limit, so. Thank you all for staying with here and, and, and listening to the research. Um, yeah, I think, I think we're a bit of our time. So I think if nobody has any other questions, we could, uh, we, we could end here. Uh, okay, well, thanks, Alrighty. Zachary. Well, thank you so for much. For very interesting talks. Yeah. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Take care. Have a good Stop one. sharing. Have a good one. Bye. Yeah. Round of applause. Bye.